Hello. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the March Any Tech. Um, before I start, the fire escapes and the toilets are just behind you in that direction. Um, we have two speakers tonight. We've got Dan and Martin um, talking about two very different things. Um, the way the night will work is we'll have Dan talking first, and then a short break for you to get more drinks, go to the toilet, and then talk talk from Martin, and then by then the pizza should have arrived, um, and then we can eat the pizza and you can play any of the games um, that are here as well. So who are we? Um, I'm Martha, I'm one of the organisers of AnyTech, and we have um, Mark and Chris here tonight as well, and James is also an organiser but couldn't make it tonight. If you want to contact us, here are our contact information. And if you want to see anything about any tech, this is all of our social medias. Um, if you want to talk, let us know. If you have any questions or suggestions, we're happy to hear them. As you can see, tonight's being streamed, um, and that's available on our YouTube channel, and the recording will be up straight away. So if you want to re-watch the talks, you can do. And before I hand over to Dan, I'd like to do a big thank you to Scott Logic as they are um, our sponsor for tonight. So they're paying for the food and drink. So yeah, I'll hand over to Dan. This did work. Uh, oh, man. Right. It might have just been the adapter not quite plugged in. No. There we go. There we go. Yes. Okay. Cool. So, uh, so this is me, Dan Podwell. I work at a company called CloudSoft in their uh, Tempo business unit, which is the consulting side of the business. Uh, and if you want to follow me on Twitter or send messages. Did this last week as well, didn't I? Okay, so uh, a couple of shameless plugs. I also run Serverless Northeast, which was the meetup last week. Our next one's going to be April 28th um, at possibly Rotterdam House, hosted by BJSS. Maybe. Okay, still working on that. Um, and also, I also run the AWS user group for the Northeast, uh, which hasn't done anything for a good couple of years now, COVID reasons. Uh, but we are back, end of this month, March 28th. Again, hopefully getting a location sorted soon. Um, and that's um, going to be International Women's Day themed as well. Uh, and we've got some nice goodies from AWS to give out. Uh, so hopefully uh, you guys can come to that as well. Um, right. So today I'm going to talk about SAM Accelerate. Um, has anybody used serverless in their day jobs. Okay, not many. Uh, have you guys heard of Sam? You Sam? No? Okay. Um, I think I saw a hand over here as well. Sam? No? Okay. What's the other one? Serverless framework, probably? Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of the top two CDKs in there as well. Um, and then uh, this new SAM Accelerate functionality has just come out. Uh, it's been out for maybe a few months now, but um, it's still in beta, but we'll, we'll kind of come into what that is. So for those who don't know what SAM is, uh, it's a serverless framework um, that will allow you to kind of quickly build and deploy your serverless applications in AWS. Uh, it's an open source thing that is provided by AWS, um, but anybody can, you know, it's open source. You can make changes to it if you like and they uh, obviously approve them. Um, what it does is it kind of expands CloudFormation, so it gives you a few new resource types, which under the hood are actually just existing resources that they've sort of cut down and given sensible defaults to, um, and also provides you with uh, the SAM CLI, which allows you to do the builds, the deployments. Um, it also has this tool called SAM Local, which I strongly advise against, which is why 
I think, a really great um, reason to have SAM Accelerate. We'll, we'll come to that one in a second. Um, so what do I need SAM Accelerate stuff? Well, as we just said, the SAM local stuff is kind of a bit rubbish. So um, it's basically trying to emulate the AWS environment on your local machine. And there's all kinds of things that it can't do as well as if it's going to be in the cloud. So let's say, I don't know, I want to um, send something to an SQS queue. Um, obviously, that means I need to set up some IAM permissions to allow me to do that. SAM local doesn't care about IAM permissions. It'll just let you kind of do whatever. Um, once that code then gets into the cloud, then you start coming into actual problems. So my philosophy is just get it into the cloud as, as fast as possible, find your problems sooner, so then you can make uh, progress faster. And this is how I would typically set up um, our kind of CICD slash development environment slash development workflow. Um, so the top one is a, kind of a pull request environment. Uh, this is your ephemeral kind of play sort of thing. You know, this can be torn down and built millions of times um, as you kind of work through, uh, work through your features. Um, then we have a staging environment. This is for kind of longer lived environments. This is kind of pre-production test. Um, you could have other kinds of staging environments that we just said pre-prod. Staging, maybe you want to have a demo environment for clients to use, um, whatever that may be. Um, but then the nice thing about this, I think, is that continuous development, continuous deployment um, kind of goes straight through to production. So there's no waiting around. Um, using this workflow uh, at the last place I worked at, we were getting changes into production in under 20 minutes from a, from a pull request, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and if you look at places like, I don't know, Microsoft, Google, Slack, whatever, they're doing hundreds of changes every day using this kind of model where things are just going straight into production all the time. Um, I used to work at a place where they did a six monthly release cycle. So all those changes were stacked and then there was a big release every six months and you can guess how that you know, turned out. Um, if you're delivering to production all the time, it's just a non-event anymore. It doesn't matter. You're just going straight out the door and it just happens. Um, it's just easier. Um, right, so back to SAM Accelerate. This is uh, the workflow that the SAM Accelerate kind of um, uh, suggests. So you do your SAM init, set up the project. Uh, you do this SAM sync watch, which will look for changes that are happening in your code. Um, you can then test those changes after it's done its deployment, which takes seconds. If, if, it's, if it's even seconds, it might be less. Um, when you do your test, in another terminal, you could um, table logs and see what's going on with, with those requests. You can see, get instant feedback on that particular request and, and if it's worked and if it's fast or slow or you know, things like that. And then you just kind of iterate. So people who are familiar with a, a TDD cycle, you've kind of got that red green kind of circular loop that you're doing. Um, this is how I would picture doing kind of TDD and serverless development. So you, know, you can write your test you do your SAM sync watch, obviously that test is going to fail. Um, you can then iterate, write some code, SAM sync watch will then deploy that code and you can then do that loop very, very nicely, I think. So TDD and SAM accelerate, I think work really, really well together. Um, if people have had the chance to do that, uh, great. If not, strongly recommend that kind of approach. Uh, right, now live demo time. This is always fun. Uh, okay, so can everybody see that? Let's try and make that a bit bigger. So, uh, okay, so this is a, a demo project provided by AWS. Um, it's got uh, a couple of lambdas, one called greeting, which looks like this. So ignoring all the commented stuff, all it does is basically just do a console log to, to CloudWatch. Um, and the Hello World actually does exactly the same. Um, but it's just to prove I can deploy two lambdas at the same time kind of thing. So um, there's no difference between those. Um, if we look at what's in our 
CloudFormation template or our SAM template, I should say. This is just CloudFormation, but as I said, it's got extra resources that's provided by SAM. Um, so that's my API gateway, uh, regional endpoint, blah, blah, blah. I've got logging enabled. Uh, if I start looking at the, the Lambda function, uh, the code lives at hello world. So I can see there's a hello world directory there. Uh, there's a file called app, which has a function in it called lambda underscore handler. Uh, I'm using Python 3.9. Um, what else? Uh, this is this is nice here. So this basically says uh, in API Gateway, um, map the slash hello path to this function. So if I go to the, um, the execution URL of API Gateway slash hello, uh, then that Lambda function will get executed. Uh, and we can see that the greeting Lambda is set up exactly the same way, just slash greeting. Um, and then once CloudFormation is finished running, it's going to tell me what my execution API is for each of those two functions. Okay, so if we uh, want to deploy this, we're going to do a SAM sync. Uh, I'm going to that name and we'll call it a uh, blog because that's kind of what's in the instructions. So SAM sync here is going to do roughly the same as a SAM deploy for those who are familiar with SAM deploy, um, which basically means um, it's going to run through that CloudFormation template, that SAM template, and go into CloudFormation AWS and start putting resources in the right places. Um, right, so it's doing its build and blah, blah, blah. So if we go into CloudFormation, we should see um, hopefully that running soon. There's also one other thing that SAM sync is doing that you won't see from the SAM deploy. Uh, do, do, do. Right, this is where the live demo just doesn't work. Build succeeded. Um, let's try that again. I love the silence. <laughs> Yeah, all oh, right, okay. Uh, maybe I typed something in wrong, let's just copy it. I don't think I did, but let's just pretend I did. I think I know what might have happened. Uh, two seconds, sir. I think I can. <coughs> right, let's just get rid of this folder. Okay, and try that again. That looks a little bit better. So I think I had some state left from the last time I ran this. And instead of doing the SAM delete, stack from the terminal. Uh, I just went into CloudFormation and removed it from there. So my local SAM state thought, oh, I'm, I'm you know, synced up already. So at least I think that's what's happened. Let's have a quick look again at CloudFormation. Nope, that wasn't it. Come on, Mark, I'm dying up here. The, the curse of the day, like I know, live demo stuff. 
I shouldn't ever attempt it. Uh, you might have to, yeah. Um, right, tell you what, I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, What's up, sorry? I don't think so, because uh, it, it's a bit slow, but it's still there. So um, let's just oh, we'll restart code as well. Maybe it's just, it's not used to being outside of the serverless environment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I know that's going to fail for a different reason. I don't We may need to get Martin up, and then I'll come back at the end and do the grand finale. That's not a problem with the video. We can just like stitch together, right? As, as seamless. It's live. You probably did, and I wasn't paying attention. No pressure. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, this isn't gonna work. Uh, I'll need time to sort this out. Uh, Not in front of a bunch of people. I'm sure yours will be flawless. So. Uh,
So I think everybody's back now. Um, so if Martin wants to come to the stage while well, Dan sorts out that we, it's Wi-Fi problems, so it, it will eventually happen. Yeah, Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, does this work? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Apparently, I don't have to do this. Uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Martin Moxon, uh, and I'm just going to give a brief talk about my experiments with WebAssembly and Nintendo DS. Uh, recently, so got a little clicker. So I'm a senior developer at uh, Software, and most of the things I do is uh, uh, web web applications. But sometimes I do a bit of cloud stuff as well. Not not as much as uh, as as Dan though. Uh, and yeah, I've uh, got a few uh, WebAssembly projects I've been working on, just like outside of work, and this is one of them. So, uh, just before I start talking about WebAssembly and Nintendo DS, I just thought I'd go over uh, a brief introduction about like what Nintendo DS is first. So it's uh, released in 2004, um, and it's just a small dual-screen games console. And I don't know if anyone had a Nintendo DS. The, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the I guess the main selling point is like the bottom screen was like a touch screen. That was the, the main fun part. And the games came on these little uh, cartridges. And yeah, so one of the things I used to like to do with uh, games consoles I had was try and get them to run like emulators and like unauthorized uh, code. <laughs> just because, you know, this is what any kind of engineer of any type t tries to do, right? You try and get things to do things that they're not meant to do. Um, and uh, yeah, like a lot of other games consoles, that was like there were various different ways you could achieve this because often if they had like writable memory, like the original Xbox or like PSP, you could. There were usually uh, exploits that let you um, bypass a lot of the copy protections that were built into them to stop you from running unauthorized code. But uh, with a Nintendo DS, this wasn't really possible because the firmware was was read-only, so. Uh, you kind of had to go for a hardware solution. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of the things I used to run on a Nintendo DS was emulators. And, uh, oops. Sorry. Yeah. Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo, I still maintain, is the best, uh, is the best Mario game. And that was the main thing I was using the DS for, was to run Super Nintendo games. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so this is a, a Nintendo DS flash card, so it's actually like a modified uh, DS uh, cartridge, and you can put a micro SD card inside it, and that's actually how you would essentially be able to run um, an authorized code on a DS, so it's kind of cheating, because like, unlike a lot of these other things where you had to do, other consoles, you had to do more clever things, uh, for the DS you kind of just had a pre-packaged a pre solution. Uh, yeah, so at the time I was doing a lot of these things, um, I didn't really understand a lot of what I was doing. So I was mostly just following like, instructions from the internet. And I was like, why, why does everything, why does it have to be FAT32? What does that even mean? Why can't I get the DS to run RuneScape? Uh, but like, I did learn quite a bit about computers through doing this, uh, like quite early on. Uh, and then uh, recently I found my, my DS in a, in a drawer. It was a bit... Uh, battered, uh, but still more, well, it actually has now broken. I have a different one to show you now. Um, but it did work when I tried it. Um, and I thought, you know, oh, all these other people who've been making these games, I thought I'd give it a go. I'd try and uh, make, it, make, some, make some games or apps on it myself, because I know how to write software now, which I didn't at the time. So yeah, there's, um, there's some quite good tools available for uh, writing Nintendo DS games, most of them are in C and C++, which is arguably not very, you know, beginner friendly. Um, uh, but I thought I'd, uh, I'd give it a go anyway. So uh, there's a team called uh, DevKit Pro and they make uh, two products, which are, or two pieces of software, which are useful for making Nintendo DS games. There's a DevKit ARM, which is like a modified version of uh, GCC with a C compiler. 
And then there's uh, LibNDS, which some people have reverse engineered based on lots of uh, technical documents to interface with the Nintendo DS hardware. Um, but making Nintendo DS games actually has like quite a lot of uh, technical restrictions because of the hardware. So there's actually only four megabytes of RAM available on a, on a original model uh, Nintendo DS, which even for the time it was released was not very much. So the, the PSP um, original series, which came out the same year, had 32 megabytes of RAM. And also uh, the Nintendo DS um, architecture is also quite hard to deal with because it actually has uh, two CPUs, one for each screen, and one of them is an ARM7 CPU, and one of them is an ARM9 CPU, and you have to compile the code in a certain way to get them to, 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 to work together correctly. It's a, it's a, bit, of a, it's a bit of a pen, but um, it's, it's fun to experiment with. But yeah, again, it's not very beginner friendly. So I, uh, I had a little bit of a play around with just like some of the basic tools, uh, just getting, just drawing some images on the screen and moving them around, playing around with the network calls. So I was like doing some raw HTTP requests just like through a socket. And that was, that was kind of fun. Never did manage to get SSL working though. So it's all uh, unencrypted. Un un uh, but then, uh, you know, I had the, the thought that reaches every area of software development. Can we just do this in JavaScript instead? And the answer was, well, not not really. Uh, it it would require probably putting a a full um, JavaScript VM onto a Nintendo DS, which um, like a like a v, like the V8 engine, for example. And because of things like the just-in-time compilation, the the memory usage is really like unpredictable for um, something as low memory as a Nintendo DS. So it wasn't really suitable. But there is uh, something which is similar-ish to JavaScript, which is assembly script, which is a modified variant of TypeScript that compiles to uh, WebAssembly. And so the advantages of, of using something like WebAssembly on Nintendo DS is it's, uh, it has like a much lower overhead. So there's like a much less sophisticated runtime needed to, to, to run it. And I guess I'll, I'll just go over a bit more of that. Um, in a moment. So normally when people talk about WebAssembly, they'd normally think about it in terms of like running in the browser, uh, because that was the, the original like intention of WebAssembly. It like evolved from um, Asm.js, if anyone's aware of that, like as a thing uh, Firefox, uh, sorry, Mozilla originally developed. Um, but actually the, the sort of almost accidental side effect is uh, WebAssembly is actually like a, a very portable um, native, like, oh, sorry, not non-native, but like binary format that can be easily um, either like interpreted or then like slightly further compiled to native code on like lots of different systems. So it's like very low level. It's all like, you can th think of it as like being, uh, yeah, like, just, yeah, just almost native code, but not quite. It's not quite there. Um, yes, so. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I thought about was, well, if we're going to try and run WebAssembly on Nintendo DS, we need a way of doing it, of running it. So uh, something like, obviously, like the f using uh, a full web browser or even just like a V8's WebAssembly um, engine, that, that, would, that would be out of the question because it's, it's again too heavy, especially given the, the memory um, availability on a DS. But there are like outside of the browser WebAssembly uh, runtimes available and there's three big ones. So there's, uh, well, there are more than three, but these are the three that are, um, come up, I guess, the most. Uh, WASM time, which is supported by the uh, Bytecode Alliance and so they support um, ahead of time compilation. So that's sort of like taking your WebAssembly and then like just compiling it to native code to run on your specific machine. And then there's like just in time compilation available as well, which is similar to what um, the V8 engine would, would do to your JavaScript in a, in a browser, for example. Like if you have a lot of like heavy loops, it will optimize it automatically. Um, and similarly, there is a Wasma. Um, they claim to have like better performance than Wasm time. Um, I don't know how, I haven't 
evaluated whether that's true or not, um, but they, they like to talk about that a lot. Um, and they're also the company behind uh, Wapham, which is sort of the WebAssembly package manager. I guess they're kind of trying to develop an analog to NPM, but for WebAssembly packages. And the third one I looked at was uh, WASM3, which is uh, just a WebAssembly interpreter. So there's no just-in-time compilation. So there's no like clever optimizations. It literally just takes your WebAssembly um, uh, code and just executes the instructions, uh, well, like an interpreter would. So uh, it seemed like uh, WASM3 is actually the, the best option of the three because although um, WASM time and WASM are supported uh, things like ahead of some compilation and just in time compilation, which are um, useful performance optimizations, like normally, I guess if you have a, a, a relatively powerful PC and you have some heavy computation, because the DS has like a very small amount of memory, uh, things like just in time compilation were not really necessarily a good idea because you couldn't predict how much memory the program would use because it would be trying to dynamically work out what to optimize and also um, and also that would add overhead as well like because there's limited CPU available and same with the head time compilation like if you were to if you were to try and compile the program to the native code before you run it at the beginning of every execution there'd be a big startup latency so it's not really neither of them are really suitable for for games on a low-end machine like an Nintendo DS um, but also the thing that was good about WASM3 was uh, it has a really small uh, code base. So it's just written in C. It doesn't use very much, um, very many system calls. Like it's not very platform, tied to any particular platform. And it was actually very easy to compile to um, the, the sort of ARM environment that Nintendo DS uh, uses. Uh, and also, uh, one thing that sort of, it sort of like proven itself a little bit already was that um, WASM3 has already um, proved to work on the Arduino, which is a much less powerful machine, even than the Nintendo DS. So that seemed like a good, a good, uh, a good pointer towards why it might be uh, good to use. So that's why I picked WASM3. So uh, I thought the screen might be bigger than this one. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I didn't realize there'd be three smaller screens, but uh, here's <laughs> here's a, a little bit of a uh, code. Uh, that's um, the main, I guess, the main function in uh, C++ for loading a WebAssembly module. It's not super important what a lot of it's doing, but essentially the important part is, uh, I guess, here, where we're um, loading in this entire WebAssembly module just as an array of bytes. Um, and I'll explain in a moment where those bytes come from. And then we have one function that we find um, from that module, which is th the WebAssembly export, just a function called start, and then we call it, and that's basically it. Um, typically, when you're doing this, you'll actually see like a slightly more compli complex one where people are doing like a lot of error checking and all this kind of stuff, but I just stripped all that out because, you know, who cares? If it crashes, <laughs> just, just turn it off and on again. Uh, so yeah, uh, so since it's uh, like fully interpreted at runtime, uh, you can you can actually like there's, there's, there's different ways you could get the bytes um, into the into the program. So you could fetch them from a network. You could read them from like a, a disk if you have a flash card and you have an SD card and you have access to that kind of stuff. It doesn't really matter. You know, you, you could you could tap the bytes in with buttons. But point is, uh, in this case, I just chose a, the quick and easy option, which was just to turn the uh, compiled assembly script uh, WebAssembly file into a C header file that just contained all the bytes and then just compile it directly in. Um, so like sort of cheating a little bit, but saved a bit of time. Uh, oh, sorry. And uh, yeah, and this is the, this is just the header file. So it's literally just a huge string of, uh, yeah, of bytes. So I guess uh, so far I've just been going through this fairly quickly, but this is essentially the build process for um, building the WebAssembly DS game. So all the core game logic is written in assembly script. Um, that's compiled to this um, app.wasm. Um, and then there's just a small script which you use to just turn that into bytes. And then it's linked together with these, these are the two uh, C++ uh, files. So 
the main the CPP is just the function I just showed you. It just it literally just loads the WebAssembly module, but it also does one other thing, which is it calls some functions that are written in uh, nds.cpp, which um, expose uh, native functions from the from libnds directly to the WebAssembly module. So I guess it's all a bit abstract at the moment, but I'll it'll hopefully make more sense um, in a moment. So the, so if you want to call uh, a native function from uh, C++ from assembly script, you first have to um, provide it as an import to the WebAssembly module. And I guess this is how you would do that. So you first have to write a wrapper function for the function that you want to make available um, and tell, uh, tell uh, I guess, the WebAssembly module how to call it. So you say, oh, it's uh, you know it has it has a const cast r um, argument, and this is this is the example for print, for example. Um, <clears throat> you have to link the function to the WebAssembly module. So here, I don't know if anyone can read this, but this says, uh, you know, you have a you have a namespace, then you have uh, the the name of the function that you want to declare to make available for the module, and then this is the sort of the type of the fun of the function. So it's a a void function that takes um, an integer. And then you have just this, uh, this which just refers to this. And then the bottom is assembly script. So while this is sort of passing the print function as an import to the module, the last part is sort of declaring in assembly script that you're expecting an import, I guess. And that just makes it be declared as an import in WebAssembly. So, uh, yeah, so passing uh, arguments from assembly script to C++ is, uh, is, is quite interesting, I think. So assembly, uh, WebAssembly doesn't, at the moment, have any particularly like, complex types. They're all um, just like basic numeric types. So say if you want to do, call something like print, uh, you can't actually pass a string. You, you, all you can pass is a number. And so what it actually does is it passes um, just a pointer to um, so WebAssembly. Uh, yes, the assembly script side of things will just pass a pointer to uh, the location in its own memory space of like where the string is located, and then C++ will just add on the pointer that points to the beginning of the linear memory for that WebAssembly module, and that will tell it where to find the characters like directly from the module. So it's sort of like assembly script will write into its own memory, you know, hello world. And then C++ will actually just use that pointer, which will point to this hitch, and then just read the byte directly out of the memory. And so that's kind of how you get around this, um, this kind of limitation. Um, one thing that's uh, technically cheating a little bit is uh, assembly script actually uh, encodes the bytes as UTF-8. But, the, but most of the functions only accept ASCII, but fortunately, because ASCII is like a kind of a subset of UTF-8, as long as you only use ASCII characters, it won't break. If you, if you use non-ASCII characters, I'm not sure what happens. I think it might crash. Uh, so don't do that. Yeah. So yeah, so I guess this is, uh, we've, we've mostly been talking about C++ and like low level things so far. So I guess this is, Basically, the, the entire point was to lead up to being able to do things like this. So the, the actual game I've made is a, a very basic like snake game. Um, and it's actually, the, the idea was just based on someone else had already made a snake DS game, and I basically just made a clone of that, but in assembly script. Uh, yeah, and I guess if you've, if you've ever written JavaScript, or, or especially TypeScript, um, this will probably be like fairly familiar code. It's just like a... So just a class, you know. I think I think it's it's fairly fairly easily understandable um, things. The only thing it has is a few extra like type annotations that you wouldn't necessarily need in normal TypeScript, but they they they, they become like fairly obvious fairly quickly. And here's a picture of the game. So uh, that's just a GIF of it. But I actually have um, a demo of the game possibly working. <laughs> <laughs> so this may become a, we might have to swap again in a minute if this doesn't work. Um, so 
obviously right now we've got assembly script compiled to the WebAssembly uh, built into a Nintendo DS ROM, but there are also Nintendo DS emulators which can be compiled to WebAssembly running in a browser. So, <laughs> so this is a demo of WebAssembly running in DS, running in a DS emulator, running in WebAssembly, running in a browser. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think it, there we go, yes. So this is it, so very exciting, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but also I'm left-handed, so I'm kind of struggling a bit with the controls, but <laughs> yeah, so there it is. Uh, and I also have an actual DS, sort of. This is actually a DSi because my DS broke, but uh, it does run the same, the same game. So if anyone wants to have a go at this at some point, I can, I can set this up. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's basically, hang on, back to the slide. Yeah, uh, yeah, so that's basically the end. Uh, any, any questions? Yes? Oh, thanks. Yes? Why doesn't it work on my phone? Why doesn't it work on your phone? Uh, who? Me? Oh, uh, I don't know. I only prepared it. I spent, I literally spent like five minutes getting it to work on here and that was it. Uh, any non-phone questions? Yes? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would it not be easy to use a PSP? Um, maybe. I guess a PSP is, is more powerful, um, but my PSP is also broken. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, but I actually do also have PS, uh, custom firmware on my PSP, so I, I, if anyone's interested, maybe I, I, can, I can do that as well, you know? Uh, yeah. Do you need to write it in assembly script? Uh, no. Uh, so yeah, I, maybe that's something I sort of skimmed over, but the whole point was that although I've written this in, in assembly script, um, you, can, you can write it in any language that can compile to WebAssembly, which is quite, quite a lot of them these days. You know, you could, write, you could write it in Rust or Golang or I think Golang can, I, th I think Golang can compile to um, WebAssembly. Um, I guess I sort of picked assembly script just because a lot of these other like things like Rust, for example, you kind of think, well, that sort of seems like kind of a program lang language that you would be able to natively execute anyway. So I thought that might seem a bit confusing. Um, but yeah, any anything that you can compile to WebAssembly, you could you could run in this environment. So like, the main thing is not really the game. It's more that the game is kind of like the the, the project is like kind of like a shell that can run any WebAssembly. The game itself is a is a bit rubbish. Uh, yeah. Any, anything else? No? Okay. Who's, do you want to have a go with your, uh, yeah. anything? There you go. Okay. This? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. We'll have, like, a five-minute break. Feel free to get yourself another drink if you want, and we'll just have to change over the mic, so... Are you ready to go? I'm good, yeah. yeah, the connections work now. Yeah. It was always the Wi-Fi. Yeah. It was the always the Wi-Fi.
Ah, uh, I mean you turn it on, that's the problem. Was it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> All good? Okay. Uh, right, hello everybody again. I uh, hope you're all properly lubricated this time. And uh, yeah, so uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, yeah, hands up, no idea. But we, we have deployed a CloudFormation stack to AWS. So um, I'm not making this up. You can see it on the screen. It has worked this time. Um, and as we can see in CloudFormation, uh, when you do that first SAM sync, it actually creates three stacks. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so we can see. Um, so we've got our, our kind of SAM CLI manage stack. So that's uh, just the default one that the SAM CLI uses to create an S3 bucket to store you know, your, your Lambda code zips and uh, you know, the, the uh, resolve template files and things like that. Um, it's created two other stacks. Uh, our main application stack, we call it blog. Uh, and then it's created this other one for our Lambda layers. So uh, for anybody who's, who's kind of coded with Lambdas before, um, the Lambda layer thing came out, what was it? A couple of years ago now, I think. Um, and it's basically a, a, a bit of code that kind of goes into the, the container that the Lambda runs in um, before it, it kind of puts your, your code on top. So that's why it's kind of a, a, a layer. So it puts that code on, then it puts your code on. Uh, and then you can have up to five layers. Um, the nice thing about layers is uh, they can be different things. So you can use them for your dependencies. Um, so you don't have to um, package them up with your actual Lambda function, it can just go in as a layer. So you don't have to have this kind of massive function thing. Um, it, you can just put in a layer. Um, you can also use it for different runtimes. So uh, the typical runtimes, you know, Node and Python and I don't know, Java, .NET Core or whatever, um, you can use other ones like Rust or Bash or something else. Um, if, if you don't really like the, the provided runtimes that are there. Um, so the nice thing about this is it manages those layers for you. So um, in this particular case, it's managing the dependencies, not, not any kind of special runtimes, but you can see in, in each of the um, functions uh, in Python, requirements.txt is your kind of typical dependency, um, you know, like package.json. Uh, your dependency descriptions, I guess. Um, so I've got two in there, requests in Bodo 3. Bodo 3 is the, uh, the AWS SDK uh, for Python. Um, and there's a, a layer for each function. So there should be uh, two layers. So if I go into uh, the Lambda functions, so I can see there's, there is two different functions there, the hello world function, and the, uh, the greeting function, if I go into the hello world function, I can see that there is a layer there. Um, and it's the, well, yeah, there you go, the hello world function layer. Um, and there'll be another one for the greeting function layer, which is just that uh, l packaging up of, of the dependencies. So once we get back into this kind of SAM sync thing, so what can we do with this? So there's a few different things. Um, let's say, for example, uh, I wanted to change the code. So if I go into uh, my greeting, uh, greeting Lambda, and um, I want to say hello world from uh, NE Tech. Uh, if I now do a, uh, a SAM sync, uh, let's pick one uh, from the list of different things. So we do a SAM sync uh, code. So what this is going to do is only going to sync up the different code parts. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is it's not going to go back through CloudFormation. So if you remember from the presentation, there was that kind of three different environments that we had for uh, setting up CI, CD. Um, now we're kind, you know, using SAM sync, we're sort of 
stepping away from cloud formation. We're, we're going to be using the APIs directly with the different services. So I'm going to be sending code straight to my Lambda function. It's not going to go through the cloud formation stack. So if I do this, hopefully this should work with you guys watching this time. Uh, so you can see it's, it's now building the Lambda and syncing it um, with uh, what's already there. And in a couple seconds, it's done. So if I had to do that through CloudFormation, if everybody, have you used CloudFormation? That takes a long time, yeah, minutes probably. It's really annoying, it's slow, it slows you down. If I'm just hacking away, you know, doing, let's say TDD or iterating through a function, um, this is really nice because this is really fast. Um, if I go to see that function now, so if we go and look at uh, which, which one was that? That was the, the greeting one I just did, wasn't it? Greeting. So if I go to uh, my greeting function, so I can see, uh, you know, the code is there, hello world from any tech. And more importantly, if I go to CloudFormation, if I go to this stack, Right. Uh, if I go to the events in the time that it happened, 1826. So that was half an hour ago. It definitely hasn't done anything with CloudFormation and it's updated my code without CloudFormation, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. So it's a good thing because it's nice and fast and I don't have to worry about CloudFormation being slow. Um, but in, let's say, a production environment, I've removed my ability to roll back. And I also have removed the ability to do any kind of drift detection. So there's now code that's in an environment that doesn't really sync with what's in CloudFormation. And that's kind of, a, in, in a production environment, that's a bad thing. You don't really want to do that. So this is a development only kind of tool. Definitely don't do this in production, pre-production or staging or any kind of other environment. This is. Again, just for that nice, really fast kind of development workflow. Um, there's other options as well. So uh, if you guys can see that, we'll make that a little bit bigger as well. So I can, uh, I won't run through all these, but we can um, only update our serverless function resources. Uh, I can only update, um, things that have a particular resource ID. So if I want to pick a particular function or if I pick, you know, API gateway or whatever, I just give it the resource ID and it's only going to update that particular thing. Um, but the, the best thing about, I think the Samsung stuff is, is this one, this is watch. So, uh, anybody familiar with JavaScript, um, probably knows about watch, you know, just watch, uh, watch your files. Um, so what this is going to do, it's, it's just going to sit there and sort of wait until something happens. Um, so it's going to watch for changes. Um, the first thing it needs to do is kind of sync and make sure that it's on the same page. Um, so you can see it's kind of going through that initial sort of SAM sync stuff. Uh, da -da -da -da. So this does take a little bit longer. But once we get into the watch stuff, um, it is nice and fast. I'm sorry? Uh, no, I, I cannot. Got a guitar? I'm taking lessons. Still not very good. Um, okay, so sync's complete. We're now watching. Um, so actually, let's also, whilst we're here, so uh, if you remember from the output in the template, it's outputted our two um, execution URLs. So if we just go to one of those, um, greeting, yep, hello world from any tech, which is the, um, uh, the message I put in the, in the Lambda in the first place. So if we change that, so let's say, um, hello world from, I don't know, uh, Newcastle, right? As soon as that file is saved, because I've got the autosave on, great. It's now automatically syncing that code to AWS. A few more seconds and it's Done, almost done, done, come on. Ah, we'll call it done. 
So if I now go back to the browser, right, that's already there. You know, you can almost think of it like a, like a hot reload, I guess, in monolith kind of, um, kind of land. Um, and even, not even better, but also, let's say, um, let's go to the other one. Uh, so as you, yeah, so this, this function is using uh, Boto3. The other function is, is not using Boto3. Um, so let's just make them the same. Let's make both functions have um, Boto3 as dependencies. Um, you might wonder why, because the Lambda runtime actually includes the AWS SDKs by default. So things like Boto3 or the JavaScript one, or whatever that one's called, um, it's already in the Lambda runtime. So uh, by including it in here, what I'm saying is I want the latest one that's available because the Lambda one, it may be a couple of versions out of date, but I want some bleeding edge functionality. So I'm going to include my Boto3 dependency. And as we can see, the watching is doing its thing and it's now creating a new Lambda layer and it's putting that into the function and syncing it and sending it out. And great, it's, it's done, perfect. I've updated my dependency in like two seconds, less, or maybe less. Um, oh, sorry, still a few more seconds to go. But it, it is kind of, you know, that nice and quick and fa fast and easy. Um, the other really nice thing about this as well, so if I wanted to um, tail my log, so uh, by default, uh, you get a CloudWatch log group attached to your Lambda function, so you can go into CloudWatch and look at your, your log streams. Um, this kind of goes one step further and will also give you your X-ray traces. So I can see kind of what's going on. So I can see there was you know, one total request. Uh, it took 0 0.192 seconds for that, um, for, for that particular part of the request. Um, and then there's the CloudWatch logs themselves. Um, so I was billed for, oh, it's got the billing time, uh, da, 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 yeah, billing duration, two milliseconds, da, 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 da. So all the stuff that you'd see in CloudWatch logs, you can now see in here. So if I just uh, hit that again, so you should see another kind of request as soon as it hits the, the CloudWatch logs. There we go. Um, and the X-ray events and all that stuff that's going on. So as I'm developing, I can hit these functions. Um, I can see what's going on in the logs. I can see what's going on in X-ray. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that's, that's pretty much it. So. Uh, a working demo. Yeah. There Does anybody have any questions for Dan? If he wasn't even expecting them. Does the watch function work with pre-compiled lambdas? So pre-compiled jars, for example. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I haven't tried. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't get a, a chance for what I'm doing now to play around as much as I used to. Um, honestly, don't know. I, I, you know I, th I, would, I would imagine so because it's, you know, whatever you put into that Lambda function um, should just then be synced up with whatever's in, you know, in, in AWS. So I can't see why it wouldn't be. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. So I'm just looking for use cases there. So let's say, would you say like a proof of concept, that would be exactly a good use case for that? Uh, As you're showing, let's say you're showing this proof of concept to someone else, you, you want this, want to change something, if you can change it like that, then 
insured, yeah. But I would, yeah. So uh, I, what I would probably do is uh, use my kind of ephemeral environment, pull request environment, whatever you want to call that, um, and just play around in that, yeah? And then, you know, you're not in danger of, you know, breaking something in production or whatever. You've got a nice clean environment. You can tear it down, spin it back up again. Um, you could have an entire serverless application in there that you could bring up and destroy uh, within minutes. So um, I think serverless in general is a really good tool for things like proof of concepts or um, quick kind of development um, that you don't really know where it's going to go, uh, if things are going to last. Um, startups in general as well. I think uh, people probably heard the term API first development. Um, I'm also serverless first, mainly because it's just fast, fairly straightforward, easy. There can be some trickiness, um, but for the most part, to get something to production or to the market as fast as possible without figuring out, you know, what your security group needs to be to be secure and not allow, you know, Russian people into your server, um, you know, uh, just as an example. Uh, then you know it's it's the way to go. I think. Completely agree with that. Thank you. Is there any more questions? If not, then I'd like to say a massive thank you for both Dan and Martin for giving talks today. Chris has just gone down to get the pizzas, so they'll be here any second. But before they do, I like uh, our next talk. Our next meetup is on the fourteenth of April. Um, so it'd be great to see you all there. And if you do ever want to give a talk at any tech, let again me, me or Mark know, and we can arrange that for you. But yeah, thank you again to Dan and to Martin. Um, feel free to get a drink, and the pizzas will be here in less than a minute, I'm sure.